So, so is it okay I start? Yes, please do, Jan. Okay, I'm very sorry for these complications. I am not uh, really that uh, competent with Zoom. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation and uh, uh, good, uh, well, good evening in Europe or good morning in the US. Uh, what my talk is about is basically to explain this informal uh, question in the title of my talk. So pretty much the whole talk is about to make it mathematically precise and, and share some thoughts about it. So I'll have, uh, I, I welcome if you ask questions during the talk, but I'm completely unable to, to read chat while talking. So just uh, interrupt if you want. And also, of course, point me out if there is some, you know, black shadow over the slides or you don't hear me or anything like that. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. So uh, the, my, uh, basically the only introductory or background slide is this one where I want to lay down the definition I'll be talking about, the ku kraghoff definition of a propositional proof system. And uh, it's, it's uh, very interesting and important. There are, of course, many uh, logical calculi which, which form a calculus for uh, <coughs> propositional logic, but uh, this definition somehow abstracted from all of them and uh, uh, kept from the logical calculus the property that it is recognizable, uh, the proofs are recognizable in polynomial time. So this really freed hands from some kind of finitary combinatorics and, and found a bridge between propositional logic and uh, <coughs> complexity theory. So uh, let me interrupt with a question. Do you still hear me okay? Yes, it's still okay, yes. Okay, good. So <coughs> the, the fundamental problem in the area, at least the fundamental problem, which seems uh, to me be the key one is whether the there is a, proof system which allows polynomial size proofs of all tautologies. And as Cook and Rekhoff pointed out, this is really equivalent to whether NP is closed under complementation. Now, a holy grail in the area, everybody wants to simply prove super polynomial lower bounds for as strong proof system as possible. But in fact, why? Because unless you prove it for all proof systems, you are not solving the fundamental problem. So what do such lover bounds actually have as their consequences? So we should uh, remember this fact, which you probably heard a few times already during the, the, the workshop, namely that even for the ordinary textbook calculus based on modus ponens and a finite number of axiom schemes, we do not have uh, more than quadratic or super quadratic lover bounds, but certainly not super polynomial lover bounds. So we are not really that good at proving lover bounds. And the question is, if, we, if you prove a lover bound just for some particular proof system, what is the significance? Now, one thing which may happen is that you are lucky and you actually prove it for a proof system which happens to be optimal which means by definition that the size in, in this proof system are at most polynomially longer than in any other proof system. So proving clover bound for the optimal proof system would simply be as, uh, would imply a super polynomial lower bounds for all proof systems and you solve the problem. Now, somewhat stronger <coughs> notion is P optimal where not only that the proofs are not much longer, but you can translate into P proofs from any other proof systems. So uh, this is what uh, would be good enough. But the problem with uh, sort of waiting for such a lucky day is that we do not know whether such an optimal proof system exists. That's the optimality problem. And it does not look very likely. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say that it is really unlikely. I mean, some people seems to be fairly um, clear on what the true answers to the fundamental problem and to this problem are. I am not so sure. I think that one should keep an open mind, but uh, we simply do not have a good reasons to believe that there would be such a proof systems. In fact, this optimality <coughs> problem relates to very many different areas 
in structural complexity and finite model theory and um, proof theory and so on. And uh, it usually leads to some statements which the people who are experts in that particular area find unlikely. So kind of the collective uh, reasoning is that such an optimal proof system probably should not exist. But on the other hand, if I could prove that, for example, extended frag is optimal, I would be delighted. Now, uh, however, <coughs> In, in proof, to, proof complexity, we found out that even if you prove a, such a lower bound for a proof system, which is not optimal, you still get at least two general consequences, which I think are of, of interest. The first one can be phrased as follows. To any proof system whatsoever, you can associate a class of SAT algorithms which are the, the uh, as kind of shortest way how to define them are those which can be encoded in a way that the proof uh, system allows for short proofs of the soundness of these algorithms and then the lower bound for the proof system automatically implies similar lower bounds for all algorithms in this class okay now let me stress one fact that even if the proof system is some simple proof system which operates with uh, lines of a particle restricted form, for example, resolution just with clauses or constant depth frag system with AC0 formulas and so on, then the algorithms in this class are not restricted to any particular classes of formulas or, or they are not restricted to some a, a priori to some sub-circuit class. So it is uh, in some sense more general than to say that you have a lower bound for SAT algorithms in AC0. So uh, even if here you have a lower bound for AC0 Frege systems, then it actually implies time lower bounds for some algorithms which are themselves not AC0. So I think that this is an interesting feature. And uh, uh, as I state as a fact that uh, pretty much most, if not, uh, well, a lot of uh, <clears throat> SAT algorithms which are considered in, in SAT solving at present are actually contained in one such a class for a proof system whose soundness, whose, uh, for which lower bounds can be obtained. Okay, so I think that uh, <laughs> this is one feature which uh, has um, proof complexity, which is interesting that even partial results on the fundamental problem actually do have some consequences. Are there some questions or? No, okay. So the second lower bound <coughs> consequence for if you have a lower bound for a proof system P is that uh, we can associate a first order theory with a with, uh, proof system P, a theory of bound, so-called bounded arithmetic. And then the consequence of the lower bound is that the statement that P is different from NP is actually consistent with this theory. Now, people are very much often interested in when, where it is not provable that P different of, is different from NP. And I, I can't say I would really that much, I am interested in that, but I care much more for the consistency because the models of such a theories, stronger the theories are, the models are closer to the standard universe of natural numbers and polynomial time operations on them and so on. So in a sense, the consistency says that you don't know how it looks in the particular target structure in the standard model, but you can at least <laughs> show that the, that the conjecture holds in some structure, which is fairly close to the standard model, at least in the sense of what is true there from complexity theory. And as an example, <coughs> I give here that if you take this proof system to be extended resolution, but unfortunately we don't have lower bound for it, but if if you would take the theory associated to that, that's uh, Cook's theory of PV, PV comes from, from polynomial verifiable, and this is a fairly strong theory, which proves a significant part from a, any textbook of complexity theory, even such sophisticated results as the PCP theorem and so on. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one other connection of this link between proof system and theories is that the theory associated to proof system P cannot prove a priori 
lower bounds for any proof system which is stronger than p so if you prove a lower bound in this theory for some proof system q then you know that it is not stronger than the proof system you started with so this is a kind of a self-referential feature at least informally and i think it should be kept in mind okay so any questions so I'll, I'll now change a little bit the perspective and namely I want to ask not about the size of proofs but about the complexity of finding the proof. And so if you if you do not uh, uh, care just about the existence of proofs but about the, the their feasibility to find them then the NP versus QNP problem simply becomes P versus NP. And the optimality problem translates at least informally to the question whether there is an optimal way to search for propositional proofs. Okay. Now for the, some definiteness, I take this simple definition of a proof search algorithm. Namely, it is a proof system together with a deterministic algorithm, which for any tautologies finds a, <laughs> finds a proof. Okay. Now, in fact, this, this question, this informal proof search problem can be in fact clarified in the following two statements. First of all, that for any fixed proof system, there is such a time optimal proof search algorithm. This is an instance of Levin's universal search. And the second uh, the statement, the theorem uses some kind of classical proof complexity theory. And it says that <coughs> this, for a proof system, the, the pair, the optimal one algorithm APP is time optimal among all proof search algorithms over all proof systems Q, if and only if P is P optimal in the sense as I defined before. So in this sense, the proof search optimality problem just reduces to the original optimality problem. And so we haven't solved it, but at least we find out that we don't have a third fundamental problem. It's still the same optimality problem for the propositional proof search. Okay. Now, I th this is a strange slide which I thought a few times of deleting. Namely, I am going to introduce a certain notion and uh, after the preceding slide, it seems that there might actually not be a particular reason for that because these two statements somehow clarify the situation. But I, as a complete layman in how uh, you know algorithms are really judged in practice or in, in, in real life, wasn't quite happy with having the quasi ordering of algorithms by time or by asymptotic behavior because the reasoning is that if instead of algorithms, you think about mathematicians and you are trying to compare who is better than another. And uh, if the one would just, uh, you know, learn some particular theory and would be able to solve quickly problems concerning, I don't know, semi-groups and, but nothing else, then you wouldn't really claim that he is better. You would just sort of claim that he learned something which the other guy didn't, but Otherwise, as finds as creativity and so on goes, you wouldn't uh, just on the basis of such a such a narrow set of examples claim that it is a, a stronger mathematicians. And I think that something similar is for proof search algorithms. If we just take a proof system which simply has a super polynomial speed up over some other proof system, and you have a nicely polynomial time constructible set of sequence of examples which demonstrates this, then you can always add it to a proof system to, to, a, to a proof search algorithms to create a stronger one, but it surely sounds like a cheating. So in any case, I was kind of looking for a notion which would measure how, how difficult it is to search for a proof of an individual formula rather than of, of kind of asymptotic behavior of algorithms. Well, I'm not sure if this motivation is really convincing, but I thought that uh, I should not pretend that going from slide eight to slide 10 is kind of automatic. So the definition is, is the definition the following. To a proof system, you attach information efficiency function, which to any tautology will give a, will, will attach its 
uh, information complexity and that will be a natural number. And it is uh, uh, computed using times bounded Kolmogorov complexity as the <coughs> minimal Kolmogorov time bounded Kolmogorov complexity for which is needed to produce a proof given the tautology as an input in, into the computation. Okay. Now, <coughs> obviously, this is uh, you need at least as much time as is the size of the proof. So if you have an estimate on the minimal size of a proof, then you also have a estimate on minimal such a information complexity, namely by the by the log of the size. Okay. Now, here is a relation to the time. So the lemma one is again sort of a form of Levin's universal search. And it says that for any tautology, this quantity, in fact, pretty precisely characterizes time up to this multiplicative constant any algorithm has to take. And the second lemma says that, in fact, there is such an optimal algorithm which produces proof of the minimal possible information and in a time which is polynomial in the in the minimal time available and this this algorithm bp is sort of polynomially equivalent to that algorithm ap i had for the time uh, proof when we compared proof search algorithms by time okay so this quasi ordering if you if you don't order uh, <coughs> proof search algorithms by time, but rather by this, uh, by how they far in information, you get the uh, quasi orderings, which might be different, but their maximal elements are really the same. And so are also the optimal such algorithms. Okay. Now here is a question, here is a observation, very simple one. Namely, uh, because we know that this information has to be at least logarithm of size, then if you have a super polynomial size lower bounds, then you automatically have super logarithmic lower bounds for information. But the question is, if, if you have such a super logarithmic lower bound alone, you don't know anything about size, but you have a lower bound for information, does this actually alone imply anything of interest? And what I'm stating as a fact is that the two consequences I pointed out before, <coughs> namely the time lower bounds for SAT algorithms in a class attached to the proof system and the consistency of P different from NP with the particle theory, that they still follow from the same, uh, fr from this seemingly weaker assumption. So the first uh, is sort of obvious, uh, and the second one follows from the fact that this translation between from first order logic to propositional logic is, is very uniform. So you don't kind of lose anything in terms of Kolmogorov complexity. Okay. So this leads me eventually to the, <laughs> to the problem I am really interested in, namely the, the, the following challenge prove an unconditional lower bound for information of the form which is super logarithmic in, in the size of the formula for some proof system for which we have no super polynomial lower bound for size. So you would not be able to derive this super logarithmic lower bound from having a super polynomial size lower bounds. You, I, I am, I'm simply interested whether in some situation where we just don't know how to prove size, whether we can uh, at least prove in for our information. Okay. Now one can surely formulate various weaker versions of the problem. For example, take a proof system where we supposedly know how to prove you know, very many lower bounds like resolution, but prove such a time uh, uh, information lower bound for a class of formulas for which the size lower bounds are not known now or for AC zero frag system. But I, I put here a con as, as kind of stress here, the qualification unconditional. I think that uh, this is important in order for a possible solution of such a problem to move us forward a little bit. So uh, the second half of this slide just points the fact 
whether or not we can actually separate information from logarithm of size and and this uh, this can be indeed done under various plausible hypotheses and the keyword here is automatizability so <clears throat> you can find that but uh, this is always under the assumption and in fact if you separate information from size then then that would imply that p is different from np because it means that you cannot find a short proof and therefore results of this form necessarily have to be conditional unless you sort of expect to prove p different from np along the way to prove this okay so are there any questions i'm just uh, I, I don't see anybody and, and hear anybody so i'm just uh, curious if you still hear me okay Yes, we still do. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so um, in this slide, I'm just introducing a little notation or terminology, which will simplify the discussion on the next few slides. Namely, uh, the main parameter will be the size of a tautology, and I will call a quantity small if it is proportional to logarithm of M and large otherwise. And string will be simple or complex, whether it's KT complexity as a quantity is small or large. Okay. So what we to solve this problem on the previous slide, the, the problem on the top, what we want is some set of tautologies, which is of unbounded size, such that the information complexity is super logarithmic in m and m as i wrote above is canonically the the length of tau okay now by the remark about the link to the p versus np we should aim because we aim at unconditional lower bound we should probably expect that the formulas from set x actually do require long proofs except that we might not have a clue how to demonstrate it so the question really is whether to demonstrate uh, information complexity or complexity of proof search is easier than to demonstrate size level bounds. Now, here is a simple necessary condition, namely that if you, if you have such a set which solves the problem, then all formulas from the set have to have complex proofs. And the reason is just this kind of inequality because the, the complexity of, of proof upper bounds the information complexity of tau. Now the sufficient condition is, is that if the necessary condition holds, but on the other hand, all formulas from tau from X are simple. That means their uh, Kolmogorov complexity is proportional to the length of the, to the log of the size. Then it then such an X solves the problem. And the reason is this inequality, sort of triangle in, inequality, and uh, uh, that's a simple uh, kind of computation. Okay. Now, this sufficient condition will work for the simple formulas, but there is a reformulation of the heart of, of this situation which will apply in principle to all formulas. And that says the following, you define a quantity, uh, this, this thread IT tau double dot pi, and this is a quantity which Kolmogorov actually introduced, of course, in the not, not in time bounded version. And that was called by him information that tau conveys about pi for general strings. And that is defined by this uh, <coughs> difference. You take the Kolmogorov complexity of pi minus the conditional Kolmogorov complexity. So intuitively, if, if these two quantities are close to each other, that means uh, the conditional one has to be almost as big as the unconditional one. That means that the information which is conveyed is very little. So that's what we actually want. We want to find X, which has, which consists of formulas, which have only complex proofs, but that convey very little information about, about their proofs. So this is, this now somehow, I hope explains the title of my talk and it, it now has some kind of precise meaning. So we want to find tautologies for which we could demonstrate that they really know nothing about their proofs or very little okay so 
uh, <coughs> any questions? So let, let, let me just look at what classes of formulas we have at hand for, for this and then give one observation about this problem. So there are, in my opinion, at least, basically two classes of candidate hard formulas for stronger proof systems, which are supported by some non-trivial theory. And these are the reflection formulas and proof complexity generators. Now, people sometimes talk also about random formulas in this context, but uh, I somehow shy away from them. And the reason is that, first of all, they are not always tautologies, but that's a probably just a technical problem everybody can live with. But more importantly, I don't know about a single example where a lover bound for random formulas was proved as a kind of first lover bound for the system. It is always that you prove lover bounds for some specific formulas. And then you sort of realize that the combinatorics you used actually will apply to some uh, to, to a random formulas as well, but it's never the other way around. So may, maybe, of course, uh, you know, somebody will come up with new ideas how to do it, but I don't think they are there yet. So the reflection formulas, they express that uh, all formulas which have size at most M then they are tautologies. So, so this formula has, uh, has variables for bits of a possible proof of size M, so M bits, and then it has a variables for possible assignment for a formula and also bits for the formula. And you write down together a statement that if, if, the, if one string is a proof in Q of, of the other string, then every assignment satisfies the formula, okay? Now, they are very important in proof complexity. They are related to mutual simulation of proof systems, and they are uniform. They can be constructed in polynomial time uh, from string of length M, and therefore they are simple of small, quant of small Kolmogorov complexity. But I think that they are probably just too general to allow for some unconditional lover bound, uh, usually when using these formulas, you sort of derive one length of proofs lover bound from another length of proofs lover bound or simply uh, relate some proof complexity quantities, but uh, you don't get a kind of unconditional result. But in principle, if you find such a way, so for a proof system P, you would have to take Q, which you believe cannot be simulated by P, and then you would somehow have to show that the, uh, the, uh, every proof of such a reflection principle in P has to be complex. I have no clue how to do that, but in principle, the <coughs> sufficient condition S, the simple one could be used here. Now, the <coughs> second class of uh, are these uh, proof complexity generators, and let me say at the beginning that these are not uniform formulas, and in fact, they are expected not to even have some, uh, at least some of them are not expected to have even infinite uniform subclasses of formulas. So the uniformity or rather the non-uniformity here is important. And I think it might be important in, in some eventual proof. So <clears throat> these are formulas where, you know, in some, maybe not the most general setting, but you take a polynomial time function, which uh, extends the strings to some bigger length. And therefore, you, there will be plenty of strings of the bigger length which are not in the range of the formula and for, for of the function. And for all of them, you write down that formula which says this that it is not in the range, and it is a tautology. And uh, <coughs> you are interested in function g for which to prove that something is not in the range is very difficult. And uh, <coughs> As, as I said, so these are non-uniform examples, which are possibly very complex. We also have such lover bounds of this form for all proof systems for which any lover bounds are known. And so in principle, one, one will have to use this kind of information, which one string conveys about another, that this S prime um, criterion to possibly uh, prove something about them, okay? Now, uh, 
I am not sure how much time I have. I, I have one example of such a generator to give people idea what uh, what uh, what they are. So do, is it you, true you I have, have something ten... like nine minutes? Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. So so let me give a generator which I think is the most promising and for which uh, the working conjecture is that this is hard for all proof system whatsoever. So you take a uh, function f, uh, which, which is a p time function, which takes two inputs of length L and K and pro extends K to K plus one bits. And now you define a new function, the generator as follows. As an input, you will give it an L plus two tipple. The first string V is of length L and then the remaining L plus one strings are of, of length K. And now you apply the function f to all pairs v and u1 and v and u2 and so on. And always creating k plus one bits. So because you do this l plus one times, you get one extra bit over the length of v. So this will actually produce one extra bit. So it extends the, the input to some bigger length. Now, without much of, without losing much of generality, this F can be simply, or rather V, the gadget can be simply a circuit, which sends K bits to K, K plus one bits. F can be a circuit evaluation and, and kind of a simple <coughs> argument shows that under some general conditions, the size of circuits can be restricted to K plus, to K to one plus epsilon or certainly to quadratic in K, okay? And such a such a generators with these parameters is universal in a, in a good sense. And I don't want to say what the good sense is because that's a bit technical, but this is a, a interesting function. So this is a type of function and it's some subsumes some other functions. Some other functions connected con con <coughs> considered in this case is for example, the truth table function I will talk about just in a second. But let me also say that it is not true that if you have a pseudo random generator, then it should be actually a good proof complexity generator. Some of them have uh, are easy even for you know very simple proof systems. Okay, <coughs> so uh, now I <coughs> just want to define a notion which, in some form, is I'm surely known to everybody because I am going to use it in a theorem, which I just want to give as an illustration about the problem. Now the truth table function takes as an input a circuit in K variables and produces all two to the K values ordered lexicographically, so the truth table. And now if I have any string whatsoever, you think about it as a, as a truth table of a function. So you possibly have to <coughs> append it by some zeros to the length, which will be power of two. And then the circuit size is simply circuit size of the function with this truth table, okay? Now, when the observation is that the circuit size upper bounds the Kolmogorov complexity plus some log factors, because once you have the circuit, you just have to evaluate it on all inputs to, to reconstruct the the string okay now uh, there is a result by uh, eric allender with uh, several co-authors which actually characterize almost exactly the time-bounded kolmogorov complexity up to a polynomial change as a size of circuits which are however more general they may use oracle for a complete set in the exponential in small exponential time set okay so with this in mind that uh, the circuit size is not as, you know, it just upper bounds the Kolmogorov complexity, but on the other hand, some circuit size of some general model corresponds to Kolmogorov complexity. So with this uh, idea in mind, I'll just want to talk about the following theorem. Now, if you take any proof system whatsoever, then either you have super polynomial lower bounds for size for it. It's not P bounded. And therefore you have also super logarithmic lower bounds for information. Or there will be simple formulas, formulas of size M with small Kolmogorov complexity. In fact, in fact, the circuit size will be small proportional to logarithm of the size such that no proof in the proof system of this formula will have small 
uh, circuit size. The size has to be uh, you know, large in, in the terminology I introduced before, but in fact, it, it, it is massively large. It is M to some small positive delta. Okay. Now, I don't think that this theorem is really that difficult. I, I derive it from modifying a, a argument which used some logic, but it can be uh, you know, avoided logic. And uh, I don't also think that this argument can be generalized to these circuits with oracle from E. Maybe one could all allow oracle from polynomial space if one uses in part of the argument the so-called uh, Boolean programs Frege systems. But I don't. I have no idea how to do it possibly for the Kolmogorov complexity. So. I don't think that this is a theorem which is kind of step towards the solution to the of the problem, but you know it's an observation. So uh, let me just uh, spend two slides on giving the ideas of this argument. So what comes into it is you start with the proof system. You take a first order theory, which is some kind of base theory, which I'm not going to define, plus a special axiom which says that anything the proof system proves even implicitly is valid. Now this even implicitly is, uh, is, uh, is terminus technicus, which says that if you, that you could talk about proofs which are themselves exponentially big, but given by small circuits, and they will be proofs of exponentially big formulas also given by circuits. And in this sense, even if you have such proofs, the, the axiom will say that these formulas are valid. Then you take numeral for natural number n, and the numeral will be not composed by adding one, but rather you can combine multiplying two or adding one. And so this the length of such a dyadic numeral is only logarithmic. And one uses a, a classic uh, logic diagonalization, which I think in one go replaces two uh, diagonalizations which you would have to use if you just use structural complexity. Namely, that you have a diagonal formula AX, a formula about which the theory can prove that for every n, an is true if and only if this an has actually no proof in the theory of size at most n. Now note that this, this lover bound, which is claimed in an, is actually exponential because the, the numeral has size log n, so the instance an has size proportional to log n, while the lower bound to the size is capital N. So <coughs> it, you use an, this kind of exponential bound. And now what is going on in the argument is roughly the following. You take this an, the first order formula, and you translate it into a big tautology by simply introducing bits for the possible proof of size n. Now, this will be very big tautology, but it is actually uniform, so it, there will be a small circuit which defines it. Now, assuming that actually all such implicitly defined formulas have proofs which of small circuit size, you take such a circuit and uh, which describes the proof. And then having these two circuits, C and D, you can write down a tautology which will not be much bigger than the circuits, which expresses the fact that the circuit D defines a proof, which is a proof of the formula defined by C. And now assuming that also one fails, namely that P is uh, P bounded, you actually have a short proof of this tautology. But then you can use the special axiom of S to derive that, that an is true. And if you count the lengths of, of, of these sub proofs together, you get something like polylog in N, which is much big, much smaller than N. And that's a contradiction with, with how the diagonal formulas was defined. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this just gives an kind of idea of, of in which realm one can think about it. And as I said before, this is not the unique way. Okay, so let me just finish with a slide with references. The, this notion of information efficiency was defined in this paper, which you can get on my webpage if you are interested. And everything I mentioned from the proof complexity background can be found in this second reference in the 
book, which is, in fact, its draft is also available on my web page. So I'll thank you very much for your attention and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Thank you, Jan. Thank you a lot for the great talk. So maybe we can open up for questions now. Um, does anyone have any question? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, Jan, why, why did you say you wouldn't believe that this uh, the result could be extended to k little p and what would happen if you could? That it cannot be? Yeah, because this, well, let me go back one slide. This, this uh, uh, tautology sigma in this third item, if you, it somehow needs to talk about values of the circuit. And if the circuit uses exponential oracle for exponential time, then you, you, you lose the advantage that the circuit alone is small because to define by ordinary tautology correct values of the oracle gates, it would have to be very big. So that's, I think is, is not likely. And secondly, if you just prove it for the KT complexity, then I think that the two items together would actually imply that P is different from NP, if you prove it for all proof systems P. And not that I would be a priori against that, but I don't think you can prove it by just kind of basically simple Gödel's diagonal lemma. So yeah, I think there can be done some advanced uh, on it and uh, but not to really get it all the way to kt thank you are there other questions uh, uh i have a question actually um so do you think that um random formulas could be a candidate for separating the for for, for proving lower bounds on the sort of the mutual information between uh, the formula and its proof? Well, uh, I really don't know. I, I guess so, because, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. That, that's, that's the fair answer. So what I was saying kind of, uh, uh, I, you know, the things I said about random formulas, which were not terribly enthusiastic, are not because I wouldn't believe that they are hard or that they will serve as good examples for many features, but that you that you actually always, you know, to, to prove a lover bound, you somehow have to understand what the formula says, because the lover bound is that you are in some sense simulating a model or a situation of falsifying assignment. And therefore you ought to know what this falsifying assignment means, like in pigeonhole, principle formulas, what we are creating is a one-to-one -one map which goes into a proper subset. We somehow simulate this situation and that's that's true, I think, essentially with all other bounds. And so what is it, what the random formulas actually mean? And uh, so I think it's an obstacle in, in kind of how to think about them, but uh, I certainly accept that it may be just my obstacle. So I would be interested to see what people come up with. And especially if you can show it, uh, you know, even for some systems for which we actually know how to prove lower bounds, but without using the size lower bounds, somehow inherently understand what this informational proof search is without helping yourself with size. Well, may maybe the, the answer to this problem is actually also that it's not really a very deep problem, that it's actually a rather shallow and com completely misguided question and so on. And if somebody had a convincing, uh, you know, if somebody could explain that in a convincing way, I am certainly interested in it. But at this point, I don't see that it would be completely kind of shallow or uninteresting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thank you. Oh, I should also say about, sorry, one, one last thing about this reference is that the slides of this talk are on my web page if anybody actually wanted to have a look at anything. Okay, great. So let's uh, thank Jan once again and for this great talk. Yeah, thank you very much for listening and, and for the efforts you put into the organization. Oh, thanks a lot. It's okay. great. All right. So we'll continue later this afternoon. Uh, okay.